And so we started this work on digital twins and digital tissue to start thinking about what are the tools that we, we could use, that we have, that we need, where is the commonality in what everybody does so that we have, we can start to iterate towards, we call it digital tissue, but the, the, the digital twins, but the tools, the connectivity that allows us to connect and work together and to be seamless and to work from home, not have to go into the lab and indeed do trials remotely as well. So not so many people have to be on the work site trial site and, and so on and we've had um you know a series of demonstrations six months of working in between the lines of the of the work that we're supposed to be doing for our uh, funded to do for our, for our proper work um culminating with some great demonstrations a wonderful video which you've just watched um and then a couple of thinkings over the last two weeks led led by uh, colleagues um uh, in order to you know, demonstrate where we got to with that. And indeed, we've got workshops coming up at ICRA and, and IROS and sort of other things as well. So uh, today, what I wanted to do was just do a thinking about it all. And, and the question really says, says it, you know, from, from the experiences we've had, do we think we can do this? And what tools do we have that are working for us? And, where, and, and most importantly, where are the gaps? Where are the, the white spaces of things that we need that we don't have? And that could really direct what we do in the future and, and, and where we go. And um, we've got several people on the call today who kindly offered to pitch in and to start the discussion uh, on, on these points. Uh, people that you'll know well from, uh, from previous thinkings. What I'm hoping is that it, we do this as a thinking. It's not just a series, not just people talking all the time, but I want to get some, something going in the chat. So, um, you know, we'll try and do something provocative if we have to, to, to make that happen. Chat at the moment, mine's blank, so I'm hoping that something starts to come up soon. Anyway, we've got um, Simon, Sen, Wacken, and Mark, and Chris, Kid from Totals with us here, all who've got perspectives on some of this stuff, and I've asked to sort of present brief positions on, on this and let us know their thoughts. So may, maybe kick off uh, with Simon, uh, who's looking, uh, and maybe Sen after that, and then we'll see how we go. Uh, from that. And um, Simon, you sent us some, a few notes on the position about all this. Would you like to take the stage and um, tell us what, what you have in your mind? Yeah, okay. Good morning, everyone. So uh, the, the question of uh, can we do this, uh, can we get these smart machines and hazardous environments uh, rapidly for the design, the development and the deployment, is that possible? And I think the answer is yes, but we've got a long way to go. And I think there's three elements that uh, need to be developed to be able to realize this. I think we need modularity, I think we need standardization, uh, and I think we need open source. Um, and how, how we achieve this is we've really got to bridge the gap between academic freedom, where we can do anything we want in the lab, we use whatever software, whatever is easiest to get something working, um, and bridge that gap to industry and uh, the regulatory requirements that, that are needed for more commercial systems where they need much more structure, verification, validation. Um, there's a lot of tools that are out there that are available um, and we need to use several of these but we need to be able to use them interchangeably um, and to try and avoid the proprietary nature that, that some uh, areas have, have gone down um, where if you develop a, a solution in, in one area it's not applicable elsewhere so i'll keep my thoughts short pass on to sen yeah so thank you uh good morning everybody and so for me actually also three points but i think it's a bit different so the first one when i think of this i think we really need to have a method to make the robots and the system test the validation easy and cost effective because if we look at eventually we look at is this hazardous environments like space, nuclear, deep sea. So by nature, actually, they are very hard to access. So if we really want to rapidly develop this, I think we need to have this kind of easy access methods to test, debug, and validate the system when we can't in the process of design and also development. And the one of the best way I was been thinking this actually is what we have been discussing in the Cross Hub Digital Twin Initiative. The hybrid leverage this virtual simulation, Halloween in you know, the loop and digital twin, and all this. Actually, the second point I want to make exactly if you look at so what's been happening in the industry, actually, this has been very much used. And I think the second point is we need to really 
have a close collaboration with the industry and especially learn and borrow some of the experience from them. Because when I look at this problem, is industry have been extensively using the simulation to help them to speed up their product development process and also make their business even more efficient and faster. So some of these very good examples when I look at actually is like a French company, uh, Dashot Avi Aviation, to actually launch the business jet Falcon 7X without even using a physical prototypes. Everything was on the virtual platform, was a, was on a common database with about 27 different partners. Actually using these digital tools, they managed to reduce the assembly time by, 20, by 50%. And, uh, and the tooling time cost by 66%. And this for me actually mean, definitely means this rapid design and uh, also these kinds of examples and the experience we can borrow. And of course, also in the UK, we all know Ocado has been extensively using digital twin and simulation in their business also. I think the third point I want to make is, I think I, I truly agree with Simon, this is still a long way to go and uh, heavily using simulations and the digital twins or these tools in robotics is still rather a new domain for many organizations. And actually for me, this is also very new. And I do think we need this acknowledge accumulation and a sharing in the community. And we need to build a platform and uh, opportunities for the community to come in up together and to look at how to sort out these challenges. That, that's me. Thank you. Just unmute. Thanks, Sen and Simon. The, that's a great introduction, and I you know, fully agree with, yeah, with the points you make. I, I'd like to, I'm going to bring Aaron Kisdi to the screen in a minute. So, Aaron, get yourself ready if you're up for it, and put, get ready to put your camera on. Um, the, uh, I'd like to just drill into the point about open source. And, and indeed Dassault. Dassault and Ocado indeed have done great things with the work they've, they've demonstrated. You know, we've seen the factory at, at um, I was gonna say Blythe, it's not Blythe, is it? it's, it's uh, on the South Coast. Um, and indeed Dassault the same, they have, they have great digital tools, but they're proprietary. And Simon made the really good point that open source is the key to this. Um, but Aaron has got a point, I think, which I'd like him to make uh, about, intellectual property and open source. Aaron, would you like to take the take the screen? Take, um... Yes, yeah, I'm afraid I don't have a camera today, uh, but okay, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Yeah. Um, so th this came up a few times over the last year. We, we have developed uh, different bits of uh, autonomous software for mobile robots uh, on the ground uh, to, to have a complete system that's working. And a lot of those are quite interesting and quite robust. And um, uh, what we need is, is more use cases, more deployment, so we can uh, really um, assess the performance. They made the case to, to our company management uh, a lot of times to, to open source these tools so uh, other people can start using it, community can pick it up, and, and we can benefit from uh, additional development effort. But uh, to them, it, it seems like our, our, that is our core IP. If we give it away, then... Uh, uh, the competition will be able to do what we can do and um, uh, that's a danger and uh, I'm just not sure uh, what is the, the best way uh, to uh, actually make this case uh, in, in a corporate environment uh, to, uh, to make sure that the, I, I think they understand the benefit of open source but there is still a pushback, uh, there is still um, something that, uh, that uh, needs to convince them that uh, it's not uh, giving away something that's uh, currently valuable to the company. Okay, that, that, that's a great point. Um, I think my, my, my thoughts and my reflections on this are to look to examples of open source that have been um, successful in the industry in the past. And I always go back to Linux um, and to the way that Linux was an open source initiative. But uh, in order for it to be commercially successful, it took a commercial organization to produce a reliable installation of Linux. Um, everybody was installing their own versions and they kind of worked, but there was updates in there and not all the drivers were right and it, it kind of got buggy and it crashed. And if you wanted a version of Linux that actually worked, then you had to go to a, you know, a, a commercial organization, Red Hat. Um, Red Hat actually did rather well. Um, if you study the history of that company, 
they started in the get it right early 90s in the late 90s they did an ipo for billions um, and then eventually did an exit to ibm for tens of billions so they grew very very well and there are also great examples of that around uh, cloud software uh, uh, same kind of thing has happened. So there is a tradition, and indeed investors are interested to invest in, in companies that are deriving their IP from open source work. So the open source, you hope, is reasonably well maintained. There's a proper licensing arrangement from whoever does the open source and looks after it, curates it, to the commercial organization uh, with some money going back into the open source organization to keep it going probably based on the license. Um, but then what the company does is, is use the open source and build on it um, in order to produce things that work. So I think there is a model out there where people can use open source to uh, build successful businesses. Um, uh, and I think if you don't have something like that, then every company has to reinvent everything. If every company has to reinvent everything, then no one's ever going to get going. Um, and equally, if they don't invent everything, then they have to rely on another company that's providing it to them. Then there's a kind of supply chain and dependency there, um, which doesn't necessarily put them in a stronger commercial position. So actually, I think from a commercial point of view and from a progress point of view of companies in the UK, I think there's a lot to be said for open source to give us a platform that, that makes us go. But I'd be happy to take you know, anybody else's uh, comments on that. Um, uh, and I've not been able to keep up with the chat. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, thanks, Aaron. Right. Um, there's a few things going on in the chat about standards and benchmarks. Um, Radhika, would you like to come and just make your point about regulation and maybe go to Barry after that, just to, to build out from that, about standards and benchmarks. Radhika. Hi, hi, David, and hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm Radhika from Shadow Robots. Um, so yeah, uh, coming from a small robotics company uh, who's like uh, developing technology, which which people see is quite useful in teleoperation or remote handling or dexterous handling. The first thing that comes up when we talk to the end users is more about regulatory compliance. Uh, somehow I feel. Um, if there is something that can facilitate the initial engagements without the end user being concerned about uh, regulatory compliance in their market area, because every market area, for example, nuclear has different regulatory compliance, um, uh, like defense will have a different regulatory compliance. So how do we get the initial break in so that we can work with the end user? That's what is um, the first hurdle life face, at least. Okay. Well, maybe Chris Kidd's here from Total, and he's a pretty good example of an end user. Uh, you, you know what's coming, Chris. I hope you're ready. Um, is a pretty good example of, of an end user who's at the, at the deep end of regulatory compliance, and particularly a thing called ATEX, which we've discussed endlessly in, in, in Orca Hub. And I know Chris has got a, a few points to make. So, Chris, would you like to take the, take the floor and just give a response to Radhika and your thoughts about ATEX and uh, regulatory compliance of, of the technologies they're working on. Absolutely. I mean, I think regarding regulation and certification, there's two aspects. You've got the hardware, you've got, AT, you've got ATEX, and then you've also got the software. So being able to, to verify autonomy and both are, are certainly important. I think in the, and I see this has been recorded, so I just want to point out as usual these are my opinions not the official opinion of total but this is based on my experience from working in this in the last six years so i would say in the early days all of the oil and gas operators and i'll start with the hardware first the oil and gas operators said if it's not atex we're not going to touch it that was pretty much it and i'm an electrical engineer so that was certainly my opinion back then in 2013 2014 over the last six years, I'm not going to use the word relaxed. I'm going to say I've probably got a more considered approach. Now, this robot you see behind me, let's see, can you see that? Hopefully you can. So, at last month, Total took ownership of two Toro robots that were going to be running continuously at Shetland Gas Plant. That's where I am just now for the next 12 months. Now, 
Now this robot is, is fully ATEX certified, but we're not currently running it in, in ATEX mode. We're running it in service mode. We're teaching in new missions, we're teaching in checkpoints, we're trying to understand the failures. Now, I could do that in ATEX mode, but it means that I have to run this, um, run the robot with nitrogen. I have to pressurize it, which all takes time, which all takes special permits. And so my pro productivity on actually finding out and identifying failures with a robot would be a lot more complex having it in, having it in ATEX mode. Now, the end game for Total, the main use case still remains, is having one of these residential on a normally unmanned installation. And for that, we will need ATEX. But for me, that is years away. And I feel the industry is missing out, or is potentially missing out, on a lot of other use cases where ATEX perhaps isn't required, where you can have someone in the vicinity of the robot. And those, those use cases need to be proven to management and they need to be proven to management soon so that, so that management can see a return on investment and then keep investing in the robotics programs until we get to that point where we, ha where we have the reliability to leave that on a normally unmanned installation. Now, I don't know how many years away that is. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, but ATEX is, is certainly important, but for the, for the rapid deployment and, and testing, I think if, if, if operators and end users say, oh, it's got to be ATEX before, before we do that, we're, we're then even further into, into the future before we deploy these things. So I think ATEX definitely has to be in the back of our mind, but for, for testing, for, for debugging, um, I would rather the robots were out in the field and, and we were identifying all of, the, all of the lessons, all of the lessons learned. In terms of the, in terms of the software, and, and I suppose it's linked. Now, I know there's a workshop coming up on the 13th of January, a, a joint one between ORCA and um, the, the University of York on regulation and verification of software. Speaking at that as well, because I think that's going to be a really important, important discussion. Now, for me to run this robot just now, even in, even in ATEX mode, we have what we call a robot handler. So it's someone in the center of the robot, two, two meters away, I have to have a certified, an ATEX certified remote emergency stop with me at all times. And then I've also got another ATEX tablet for controlling the robot if, if I need to. Now, the fact that I'm essentially having to babysit this robot, you know, we're not getting any value. We're not getting any value from that. So until the software is at the stage of it, the, the autonomy can be verified, explainable, transparent, Basically, what I'm looking for is to basically go to my technical safety department and say, I've proven this success criteria, so now we no, no, no longer need the robot handler. I can step away and we can operate this, the, this robot from, from a ro remote location. Now, we can do that today. We can operate this over, over 4G. We could do that from Aberdeen. We could do it from Paris. We could do it from Po. Technically, the technology is there, but from a safety point of view, it's not there. And so that's why I think that the regulation and, and the verification is, uh, is very important because until we get to that stage, someone needs to babysit this robot in, in the immediate vicinity. Um, and as I say, Total don't see, don't see value from that. Now, Total, or I would say, lessons learned, experience, we're, we're, we're learning the hard way. You know, the, the Toro robot is the first robot we've gone from R&D. We're now in the process of trying to um, hand over to, to our our operations team, and, and, and as I say during these webinars, to tell our learning uh, along the way, we want to be part of the journey. We want to work with you. Um, don't have all the answers, but you know, happy to be part of the discussion and, and work on this, work on this together. Regarding open source, um, just a point on that as well. When I wrote the specification for this robot, it was January 18. Um, we didn't have you know any digital twin, digital architecture. We didn't have anything like that. We had a, a fixed specification that we gave to Toro, that Toro had to deliver on. Um, but since then, uh, over the last couple of years, we have um, understood that we need to have this digital twin architecture encompassing the robot. And for that, we use different partners in collaboration with Toro. We use um, Merkel Aquila and we use uh, Fusion. Now, we didn't write a specific specification for Merkel and for Fusion. 
we work in an agile and sprint way, which allows us to, you know, test things, to fail fast, to learn, and then to retest. Now, for the robots going forward, I think rather than having a fixed specification at the start, you need to work in a more agile and, and, and sprint way. That's not to say you give the technology provider carte blanche to do what they want. How it works from a contractual point of view, there may be some difficulties there, but I really think working to a fixed specification for robotics is very, very difficult because there's a lot of learning um, along the way. So I would certainly be, be recommending um, when we do future projects is that we work in a more sprint and agile manner um, for the complete project. And the open source with the APIs that we've developed um, as part of our digital architecture, I'm promoting them to, to, make them, to make them open source. Now again, that's not the official answer of Total. That's what I'm trying to do. But um, I, I completely agree with, uh, uh, with Simon and, and, the, and the others that, that spoke this morning, that open source is absolutely the way to go. There is no point in, uh, in making things proprietary. Total don't want to make money out of the robots. We just want to use them to make our operations safer and more, and more efficient. So um, absolutely, I'm a big advocate of, uh, of, of going open source. And I hope as other oil and gas um, operators um, continue on their journey with deploying uh, robots, that they see sense and, and see that as the way it goes as well. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Chris. Well, maybe maybe just, just pin you down a bit more. Barry's made a point in the chat about, um, well, just b building on that about um, uh, regulators. I mean, probably part of the way to get around the ATEX situation, or indeed any equivalent in other industries, to work with the regulators who produce the regulations because of the way work is done at the moment and work in the future will be done differently i know and therefore regulations could be different um and i know barry maybe i should bring barry to the screen about this barry if you're up for this you asked a question about standard benchmark challenges i'll, I'll get you to ask that question as well but maybe you could say a little bit about how you've been working with the regulator in the nuclear industry um, in order to deal with some of the sorts of issues that uh, chris was talking about uh, in the offshore world of ATEX, but just regulations in general. Barry, are you there? I, I am, yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we're, we're working in nuclear work, there is just enormous inertia. And I think we have to be um, uh, quite tolerant, really, that you're, you, you've got a regulator that's been in place for many years and, and they, they don't have all the people in the organisation that understand what robots can do and what, uh, what they can do safely and reliably. And so I think there is a piece of work to try to talk to the regulators and talk to the end users um, to try to better understand what can be done and what um, how, how we can make things easier for the um, uh, for the end users to adopt robots. So we we don't have ATEX issues. I've dealt with ATEX in, in offshore, um, and that really is is a problem. When we've developed things for offshore, we can't get them ATEX certified because it takes too, too long and we're trying to build prototypes and demonstrate that they work. Um, and we, the problem we have in the nuclear industry is, is with CE marking. CE marking is an awful lot easier, but we're building prototypes. We do need to test them in realistic environments, but we can't afford to keep getting CE marking for it, uh, then modifying it, getting it CE marked again and going through that cycle. Um, so the, there needs to be some recognition that we, I think we need to be able to test these robots in uh, representative environments. Um, we, we have worked with the nuclear industry to try to, I think, just better understand what, what, what problems they've got in the nuclear industry, and then to try to work out what things are generic. So if you speak to 100 people in the nuclear industry, they will give you 100 different problems. Um, and so by talking to lots of them, we can then try to get one or two problems. Now, the problems that we've got in nuclear they'll be very similar to what you have in, uh, in offshore and, and other industries. So <clears throat> I, I just think there's, there are a series of benchmarks that we could develop. We can develop them in digital and, and real uh, physical hardware. Um, but I think if we had those benchmarks, they would cover an awful lot of industries and it would provide some focus for, uh, for a lot of the research that we're doing across the hubs and, and across other um, uh, universities as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that, Barry. So that's great to hear you've done that. I'm quite. I'm, I'm reminded of the standard market requirements document that a company does when it's going to release the next product. It goes and talks to all its customers, and you know everyone wants 
I want it in yellow, I want it in red, whatever, right? But what they do is look at what's the commonality between all the customers and then decide what's the next release of the product gonna be that fits most of what customers want. And that's kind of what you're doing in a, in a slightly different way. So talk, talk to your market, talk to your customers. Who are the customers of the research that we're doing? And, and I completely get that. And Anne's made a great point in the chat though, that can we really expect a one fits all approach? And I, um, I think maybe, that's one answer to it, and from from how we think how we think about this. Um, I'd like to bring Mark Emerton to the to the to the floor, if you like, Mark. You've been making some great points in the chat there about benchmarks and targets and 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 lessons from other industries and other places that you go in your Innovate UK life. Um, uh, would you like to sort of come to the come to the floor? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, perfect. Just um, you know, let, let rip. <laughs> all right. So, well, I, I'll actually start just by addressing the um uh the open source thing or providing a, a devil's advocate position to that um because i realize that's what we've been talking now move on to uh, uh to the stuff about um test benchmarks um I, I don't have a strong opinion on this either way but i thought i'd uh, provide a counterpoint to open source winning um i would consider that uh, probably the most highly proliferated mobile robot um in our industry um in terms of the uh, easiest to get your hands on um in many thousands of numbers that many people are using for all sorts of applications um it's probably the low cost um off the shelf drone um it, it, I, i'm sure people can argue whether that's that's the case or not um and i was involved in uh, the early years of those multi-year uh, multi-rotor drones back in the sort of early 2010s um, and a huge amount of progress was made in the early 2010s in the DIY drones community and some of the associated open source projects. Um, so the RD pilot um, and various forks of that. Um, Chris Anderson, who founded that website, went on to, um, uh, to run uh, 3DR, the uh, open source drone um, uh, business, which for a while was doing quite well, but it seems to have kind of collapsed a bit. Um, and the main kind of counterpoint I want to make to open source is uh, uh, yeah, in a sort of Apple versus Android way, um, DJI popped up in, uh, it, it, and grew extremely rapidly from 2012 onwards with a closed source platform. Um, they actually picked up some of the open source code, closed it down, and very rapidly developed it. Um, through vertical integration, um, they made a system that just worked. And therefore, from the consumer's perspective, or the end user's perspective, um, it was a system you could pick up out of the box, didn't have to tune any parameters, and you just started using it for its main application. So a kind of counterpoint to the open source is what we need. Maybe actually, you know, there's another thing for um, keep it simple, stupid, looking at the Apple model of it just works. Maybe it doesn't do absolutely everything. Maybe it can't be configured. Maybe everything's closed source. Um, but the point is if they're able to actually mass manufacture things um, and make them reliable, make them work, um, there's, a, there's an alternative model there. So that's just a counterpoint to that. Um, and then on uh, my point about benchmarks, um, yeah, so again, this, in, in some ways this relates to, to open source. You'll get much more movement um, if there's a challenge that people can congregate around. Um, you have to consider that although open source, many, many businesses will be working on it and profiting from it, um, they do also tend to rely on a lot of volunteer work and a lot of enthusiasm. Um, people will often do that work um, if there is some sort of goal, some sort of prize um, that they can aim for. Um, and importantly, uh, end users and customers of these systems um, need to have some kind of um, uh, thing that they can understand, some kind of performance measure that they can use to understand what it is that they're buying. Um, this may move us away as an industry from Spent, take on a lot of risk as a business, build a prototype, go out and trial it on an expensive test you know, thing and then find and then try and invite customers to come and have a look at it and see whether it meets their needs. Um, ideally, we want to try and get to this position where we're actually uh, building more general purpose systems, putting them through more general purpose benchmark tests, and then um, uh, customers can go and uh, develop their own requirements that might not be completely bespoke, but actually um, based on general performance on general tests. Um, from an Innovate UK perspective, this is something that we're quite keen to try and support in terms of developing um, testing and proving ground infrastructure um, to try and give the UK more of an advantage in terms of um, uh, yeah, places like the Myra proving ground, but for robotics. So giving, uh, um, giving the UK some unique places in the world that people will come and test their robots um, and, uh, uh, and customers will be able to understand how they perform. 
Um, and that's something we're quite interested to kind of hear more uh, about from this community is, is what kinds of testing environments might need to be developed. Thanks, David. Great. Thanks, Mark. Those are all great points. Um, and just on the, I mean, to your point about Apple and Android and modularity and everything in my world, you know, if we go back mm. 20 years, it's frightening. You know, there was an AUV called Remus that was the one that everybody used because it was monolithic and it just did everything. It was reliable. We worked on developing modular AUVs, you know, uh, with a different business in the US, uh, C Robotics. And man, it was a problem to make it all reliable. And as soon as you changed any one of the modules, you had to test all the configurations, you know, to make sure every configuration worked. And it was a so from V and V point of view, it was really it was really rather tough. So you make some good points there, and that we need some kind of monolithic blocks. And then to the challenge point of view, absolutely, you know, I mean it, that goes back to the to DARPA challenges, for example, as well. Those are other examples. And maybe, maybe, maybe if we have this kind of cyber physical infrastructure that we're talking about, where we've got digital twins we can do hardware in the loop. Actually, a lot of it you can do without necessarily going to a testing ground. You, you need a testing ground, you've got to go there, but you want to turn up there with stuff working. And if we have the right cyber physical infrastructure it allows us to work collaboratively before we get to the testing ground, there's a better chance stuff will work and be, be well placed. So um, I sort of resonate with all those points. Um, I, I wanted to bring Mark Hanahay to the, to the floor. Mark, if, you, if you're there, um, uh, you made some points about, um, and uh, along a similar vein, about monolithic tools and modular components and open interfaces. And it's mm. probably good just to, to tease out what you were talking about there, because there's, a, there's a, perhaps a bit of confusion, not confusion, but it's important to be clear about what's the difference between open source and having something that's got open APIs, which isn't quite the same thing. So Mark, would you like to take the floor and just kind of let riff about that and anything else you've got on your mind from having done <laughs> thank, great, thank great you, demonstrations? Yeah. <laughs> no, um, so what I meant by that is that um, when, when we look at some of the robotic systems we've built, then we're actually using quite often proprietary modules. So that is actually, you know, for instance, that may even be robot drivers, but they are actually implementing um, the kind of standardized interfaces that well may well and you made the reference earlier on also to uh, linux right so that's the same as linux kernel drivers for instance there's a kernel driver it's not open source as such right you can have that as a module that has been loaded and we have the same for a lot of robot drivers if you look at the commercial part of that and we we actually also use already not only drivers for hardware manufacturers which often is closed source but you can actually also put a lot of the algorithms in a closed source way so for instance uh, where we have one algorithm where we use fleet coordination of, uh, you know, we are sending robots around on a, on a kind of a, a farm, for instance, and uh, we have the actual algorithm as a closed source component with just agreed interfaces that this works with. So I think that that works very well. Um, the point about monolithic blocks that you made earlier that sometimes they're needed because you want to have something that you just kind of take and it works, right? I think that's more towards containerization. Right? That's basically, you want to actually have a way to simply orchestrate a working system, whether that's then built of different modules or so on. You want to make it so that you actually can put it in a big tin and you can take that tin and when you take the tin out, it says, it does what it says on the tin in the end, right? So you want to kind of get this thing started. I think that's something that we really need for when we talk about our uh, digital twins and so on. So I really, um, because they become more and more complicated, they need to actually emulate not only interface, not only kinematics, they need to actually emulate the entire physics and also probably communication constraints and whatever we may have in these sort of systems. So you really want to kind of bin them up in a nice way, including specifications of, of the sort of uh, hardware constraints and stuff like that. Um, so I think that goes towards containerization. And uh, I think that's what we may want to use much more. I know this is a lot of um, businesses use that already, but that we start just making our, whatever it may be, digital trends, simulations, you would call what you mean, uh, make them very easy to, to be deployed. So, you know, as with, with every kind of robot setup you do in your lab, you also have here is the containerized digital twin version. Just do whatever preferred container system you use, do Docker run, go it for it and then you have the interfaces exposed so it needs something like that that to makes it easy because at the moment we often just spend a lot of time to get something that somebody else does going because it's a quite complicated system as you said earlier on and that's why there's little incentive to actually do it you know you can you probably spend the same time of doing it yourself with your own little kind of bits and pieces that you've got around and well often these people here we we like 
fiddling around with the bits and pieces, right? And make, make them work ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so it needs to be really be an incentive in there. I think that's that's my point I want to make. So there's there's a point made for, for modularity. You need that. And that also is, if you don't have like a one big monolithic block that is closed source, that's difficult to put in. So you want modules and they can be closed source. I have no problems with that. But then you also need to think of the, the deployment picture of how the orchestration picture, how do you get this system out for people to use easily? Brilliant. So I, I, I concur with that. So, so, so my, and I noticed that Morris Fallon here has made the same point about, uh, I missed that before earlier, about open source or open interfaces APIs. So thanks for making that point, uh, Morris. So my, so my question, I'll stick with Mark if I may. Um, so I totally get that. You know, so the question then becomes, how do we go about agreeing what the modular blocks should be and what the interfaces should be? Because, and the reason I ask that is because if you look at how people work and how people think about the, the architecture of their robots, everybody's different. I mean, some people have a sort of very sort of functional approach. Um, other people are sort of more bio-inspired in, in how they, you know, the sort of, they kind of, how they configure the modules. Um, uh, and some people think about perception and action as, as one unit. Other people see them as, as separate units. So how do, we, how do we get an architecture? How do we move as a community towards an architecture where we agree what the blocks are and we agree what the interfaces are? And I'll, I'll, I'll give Mark that rotten question, but then I'll ask anybody else who wants to chip into the chat or, or stick their hand up if you want to come and comment on that, how we move forward. Mark. Well, I'll, I'll start, but I don't know if I've got the right answer. Right. Um, well, you know, one, one word obviously is, is ROS, which has been quite uh, successful. And that was basically because it wasn't dictated. It wasn't an ISO standard or anything like that. It was grown from need in that sense. And that's how it kind of, you know, was quite successful. Um, and I, I just, for me, also for myself, it was quite a journey to go from our own little ways of how we did things. Some, there's something was cognitively inspired to eventually become pragmatic and say like, you know what, I'm just going to jump onto this bandwagon to, to make sure it kind of works. And there's some interfaces in there. It's evolving also. It's so the, I think there's a trend for more and more robotic systems, I would say for smart machines to confer to some standards. So now I see like, all right, if you not only do just hardcore robotics with ROS, with some, uh, you see like people using other kind of middlewares, MQTT is used quite a lot now, and then you kind of comply with some web standards. So I think it's, it's good to see that just not days, there's not ISO standard, this is the robotics way <laughs> of communication, but people actually are using a lot of the existing standards more flexibly and less dogmatically, I would say. And I think that's, that's a, a good way and it's kind of a really important building block for, for making progress in this direction. That's probably all I know about this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's, it's relatively unexplored, actually. I think most of us are probably sitting and scratching our heads. There's no, I'm not getting much chat on it. So I think most people are, oh, here's Adam, Lego blocks are there, then people can architect in whatever way they choose. Uh, you know, and maybe I'll bring Adam to, Adam's always got, it's usually good value on these sorts of topics. Adam, would you like to come and just expand on your Lego blocks? Because you do a lot of that in your work, um, thinking about this architecting and how we can all move forward. Adam. Yeah, thanks, David. I, I agree. Good value, uh, but often not terribly useful. Controversial is often the thing to do. No, all I'm saying is that, you know, the Lego blocks, um, you know, to, to use a sort of completely Lego based analogy, the, the challenge of Lego blocks was making them so that they, they just worked and then people can work with them and build whatever it is they like with them. I think, you know, the, the overall system architecture is going to be very different dependent on the use case. So, you know, dependent on whether that's something which is extremely heavily regulated, where everything needs to be very simple and verifiable versus something which can be less heavily regulated where you're looking for sort of more capability. Um, then I think, you know, you can build those based upon the same sort of standard Lego blocks, whether that's physical hardware or the sort of, you know, software modules that sit behind it all. But I think the challenge is making it so that all those things work uh, and making it so that, you know, people can easily work with those things, stick them together and check that the system is going to do what it's going to do. And also that it throws up flags if it's not going to work, you know. So I think there's something about that sort of whole ecosystem. Um, and then within that ecosystem, you can use the, the blocks of, you know, open source, closed source, you develop a whole marketplace then. And so then you get into the sort of concept of incentives. Why would people be involved in this? 
Well, because people can make money. If they can make a block that works better than anybody else's block, then you can sort of buy and sell it within that marketplace. But you need mm-hmm. the sort of framework that sits around it. So I think there's, I think there's something in that. But I think it definitely needs to be a sort of combination of a public-private enterprise. Um, mm-hmm. Because if, you know, to go to the Red Hat Linux thing, the reason why people pay for Red Hat is because they have teams of engineers that sit at the back end of it all, making sure that it all works. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you, I can imagine how you can submit blocks that can be verified by a team of engineers, and then they get the sort of, you know, seal of approval to say that these things have passed the tests and certification and standards that allow them to be, you know, uh, passed over to people to to use and to license and that sort of thing i think you create a whole new marketplace by doing that which could be an interesting way of doing it yeah could look at incentives one of the reasons i love these thinkings is that you manage to make a leap forward in your thinking and i just made one i think um or a connection uh shall i try and explain it i had a conversation with otterine liza she runs ukri about the nature of innovation it was a couple of weeks ago and she was making the point that a lot of innovation, it comes from mess. You, you make this sort of non-linear mess of stuff going on and somehow things em- emerge from it. And it isn't just a sort of straightforward pipeline in a linear way of, you know, you, in, in her world, you put the money in here and, and, and the, the uh, improvement in GDP pops out at the other end once you pull the lever, you know, the, the, it's, it's not linear like that. And I think, uh, Adam has just put the, hit the nail on the head. We and to the point about this has to work. If you produce standards and blocks and modules that don't work and don't suit what people want to do, then it, we're not going to go anywhere. And so that's what we need to do. We need to create a marketplace of some sort based around challenges to the points that everybody else has made, where people open source their their code if they want, or they can certain certainly make their APIs open. And let's see from the teams of people that work together, what emerges, because what emerges is the stuff that will work. And so it's a sort of evolutionary approach. Let's create the mess. Um, uh, And I I think from it, standards and ways of working and modules and blocks, people will get behind them. Why do they get behind them? Because it helps them do the thing they're trying to do. They don't have to build everything. They've got something that gives them a leg up. And there'll be different strands, Okay, so, so for the people that like doing it this way, they'll use these blocks. The people aren't using it that way, they use those blocks. And it will emerge, which is the, um, the most successful through trial and use and error. So I, I sort of rather, how to engineer that, I don't know. But the cyber physical approach is going to make it easier for us to do that. The community will decide by the way it decides to work together and build systems and do challenges. So I, I, I'm very grateful for that. Um, um, uh, moving that forward okay now i need to start talking and catch up with the uh catch up with the chat uh uh mark do you want to make your point about python 2 3 compatibility that's an interesting one to sort of dig down a bit more. i can see some head, uh, faces <laughs> shaking and, and yeah. upset um yeah i mean creating mess yeah i'm sure it does generate a lot of innovation it also creates mess um so how do we avoid um when you start an open source project, you inevitably get forks going off in various different directions. Unless everybody's all, all focused on the same goal, mm-hmm. you'll quite quickly see examples of people um, forking off the project to go and do something that suits their needs, arguments within the community that, um, uh, that fracture it. Um, and Python 2.3, for those that are not aware, essentially is a, it was a fork in that, um, in that code base that continues to cause problems today, whereby if somebody writes one, something in one language it is not always trivial to move it to the other and you end up with people having to run um you know their run their system with two um entirely different um uh in interpreters and python environments on the same system i I think i remember a joke saying that if you end up getting your python environment messed up on the computer you may as well throw it out the window and, and start again um so you know how do we avoid that how do we make sure that any open source um uh, community that is created um, stays relatively coherent um, uh, at risk because otherwise you risk just creating a, a fragmented mess in which lots of innovation happens but it isn't necessarily being beneficial for the wider community okay good point I mean at some point somebody or some organization steps in 
and gets behind one of the four. And it may, it may well be the licensing thing to, to Red Hat from Linux. You know, that the somebody picks up and produces something commercial that, you know, I don't know. But that, that's an interesting one that we, should, we, can, we, can, uh, uh, we, we can ponder. Um, I'm going to just pivot a little bit here and maybe Russell Brown, if you're there from Chevron, Russell, are you still there? Maybe you were talking about something rather interesting, going back to um, uh, Chris's points about ATEX. You, you're looking, Chevron are looking at using non-ATEX robots safely in ATEX certified areas. Wow, that's a huge, that's a huge step. I don't know, Russell, would you like to take the floor and say, say a little bit about how you're doing that? Because it plays to the, the regulatory points we were discussing earlier. Yeah, sure, sure thing, David. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned in the chat there, you know, if we approach the regulator and try to get them to include uh, robotics in ATEX regulations, that's going to take years of effort and uh, work to get that to happen. And we can't afford to wait. Uh, so, I mean, what we typically do at the moment, uh, we use uh, non-ATEX equipment all the time in hazardous areas. You know, uh, and it'll be humans using things like a battery drill, uh, and we do it under a hot work permit, and we have gas detection. And our mitigation is that if the gas detector goes off while they're using the battery drill, they have to stop work and they have to leave the area and take the sources of ignition with them. So they take the battery drill with them and leave that area. So if we've got a uh, a robot, uh, maybe, I don't know, it, it's a tethered inspection robot that's not ATEX certified and the power is being fed from a safe area, then if that robot's got onboard gas detection and it detects gas, then it can automatically cut power to that robot. If we've got uh, a non-tethered robot that's again in an ATEX area and it detects gas at the lower or below the lower explosive limit, then if that robot then retraces its steps to move into a safe area, that's no different to a human carrying a battery drill out of that area on gas detection. So then you can start having this discussion that we're doing internally within Chevron as to can we have safe methods of work in place that we can start using non-ATEX robots in ATEX hazardous areas. And these are the discussions that we're having in Chevron at the moment. And certainly for our trials and testing moving forward, we've sort of started moving away from, I think similar to what Chris said, you know, everybody saying, oh, it needs to be ATEX, it needs to be ATEX. And we've started moving away from, from that because if we rely on equipment or robotics that's just ATEX, it's a very limited market. Uh, so we started moving away from that and we're looking at non-ATEX robots and saying, well, let's start trialing and testing them at our facilities and see what they can do and see what the improvements are and not worry too much about ATEX certification. And it not only helps us as in R&D, but it also uh, helps our people at our facilities to get this familiarity with the robots and understand how they work and the safety implications. Because at, at the moment, if we knock on the door of one of our refineries that's never had a robot on, on their facility, the first thing they're going to say is, is it hazard area, area certified? No, it's not. Oh, right, we don't want it on our facility then. So it's all about the, you know, winning hearts and minds, I think, is a, it, it, is a lot of it. So that's the approach that we're taking. You know, it, it, it's similar to, let's like say, the hot work permit using non-ATEC certified equipment under a hot work permit with, with humans. Uh, we leave the area take the battery equipment with us on confirmed gas detection. Well, if we can do the same with a robot, then is that any different to our current uh, method of working? Mm. So that's, that's hugely refreshing, Ross, to hear that. And that, um, you know, the, the, the users are sort of getting to, sort of getting interested, prepared to flex in, in how they uh, try things. Um, and there's an element of trust starting to appear and and almost curiosity even perhaps so that's that's uh, that's good to hear and um, that's a big that's a big change from when we first started orca in particular because that certainly wasn't the case in all the discussions we had at the beginning so i'm encouraged a lot by that um chris has got his hand raised i can i can imagine where this is going to go chris would you <laughs> would you like to just pitch in following on from russell not going to be controversial here um 
<laughs> no, I, I completely agree with uh, with Russell. Me and Russell have had conversations on this since Sprint Robotics started in 2014. And um, absolutely agree with everything that, that Russell said. But just to compliment, Russell makes a great point on what happens on confirmed gas detection. So the robot has to shut down, but it's then what you do with it afterwards. Because the robot's not ATEX certified, you can't just leave it. You need to take that potential ignition source and the batteries out of the hazardous area. So I think we've all seen on LinkedIn various communications. There's various oil and gas operators, um, not on the call, um, who have been using spot from Boston Dynamics. And they claim, oh, we can quantify methane leaks with the gas detector. No, they cannot. No, they cannot. They can use the gas detector to, to detect gas and then spot needs to automatically shut down on confirmed gas, as Russell said. But then it's what these operators do with the robot afterwards. They cannot leave it, they need to remove it. They need to remove it from that, um, the point where the, where the gas was detected. So they cannot quantify the leaks at all. That robot needs to automatically shut down and the person that's in the immediate vicinity of the robot with their own personal gas detector, need to pick it up, or if it's a team of two, it's a team of four, depending on the weight of the robot, they need to remove that robot instantly from the point, the point of source. So I was going to raise that point, um, so just to compliment Russell. Great, thanks Chris, that's really good. But, um, and I think, I think that's the sort of the misconception, it's like, okay, we'll fit it with a gas sensor, it's safe now. It's the first step to being safe, but it's not safe. It allows you to work in a more safe way, but it's what you do with the robot after you've confirmed you've confirmed the, the, the gas detection. And that is, you need to remove it from the area. Great. That's really good operational stuff. And I think, you know, there'll be equivalents in the, in the nuclear uh, industry that I'm sure people will be familiar with and recognize. And so thinking nuclear, um, I, I'd just like to pivot. Jo Joachim Carrasco, who uh, uh, led us in some of the demonstrations, we saw him last week, last week, yeah, uh, the lead the, uh, the, 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 the webinar. Uh, um, is, n is now back, his computer crashed, and so he's-, he's Sorry, out. I can ask for two yeah, yeah, yeah. Jochen, would you like to take the floor and talk about any of the things that are on your mind about, um, you know, prices and businesses, cases being attractive or anything, or the hardening or the safety case for autonomy, those things that I know you care about. What, yeah, I mean, um, yeah. evidently we can build electronics that play out in, in, in very high, in, 1,000 maybe kilo grapes per hour or something like that. But evidently making this robot then will take a price and then how many, uh, how many environments, how many <laughs> cultural environment do you have in the world of this kind of radiation? Not? And how to make a general solution for a very, very particular problem is always in my mind as something of the the difficulties that you have there, not evidently we would like to go through autonomy there and then uh, going through autonomy in a platform where, as you pointed out previously, we don't understand well what is going to be the general architecture of the problem, not uh, if you are doing, uh, I don't know, control, I uh, am a control engineer and you are doing process control, you know that you have your PLC, you know that you have your input, your output, your communication protocol everything is well defined, you have a standard, you are confident in, in a deterministic control, control law. And here we have all these open sources that we are interfering. Uh, today we have a sensor, but then tomorrow we find a better sensor, we just plug it in and what is going to happen with your deterministic law then just disappear. Not we, it, it is this trade-off between very, very flex, being very, very flexible to new solutions and then um, understanding how difficult these environments are and how particular they are and is the trade-off between the open source that we were explaining previously that is kind of everyone can participate here but then we have a very a very particular uh, problem there how to to balance these two different uh, problems not in terms of what are, if you, I put a company for, for selling this kind of robot, how many Fukujimas do we have around? No? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, is, is that this, the big challenge that we have in, in nuclear, I think. Mm. Great, so that's, that's really interesting. So 
and that's a really good point that the evolution of hardware changes how you want to build your software yeah you, you mentioned new sensors absolutely but just think about you know uh, the evolution in computing and gpus and the advances in gpus and how that's changed what you can run in real time and, and so therefore what would you consider putting into a module that you you know to do with vision or anything uh, so so what that says to me is okay we have the marketplace we talked about that and we have forks in the marketplace but whatever it is we come up with as an architecture it has to evolve it's not going to be fixed for all time because the tasks the hardware change and so therefore it how we architect things has to change as well so that's a, that dynamic nature to this is sort of rather interesting i think and um uh, something that we should certainly to take away from me so so th thank you for that i'm conscious of time and we're down to the last uh, couple of minutes um and uh Daniel Mitchell here. Why is it Chevron think an autonomous robot isn't ATEX compliant can retrace its steps to get out of the gas leak danger zone? <laughs> um, uh, okay, but well, that's probably a bit too detailed. I think um, I, I can I can answer that. It's fine. Okay, go on, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Depends on what's quicker. If the robot can retrace its steps to a safe area quicker than a human can lift it, then let's let it retrace its steps. It's all about speed. It's yeah. all about the point of once you've confirmed the gas, getting that robot out of there. The robot's able to do it quickly by itself, by all means. But if, but if the human's doing it quicker, then that's the, the method that will be chosen. Yeah, I, I, I can add to that. Uh, we don't want the gas alarm on the robot to be set at the lower explosive limit, so we're already in a danger zone when it detects gas. It needs to detect the gas at a lot lower level than the lower explosive limit, so it gives time to perform the executive action, which would be to retrace its steps and, and get to a safe area. If we, if we detect at the lower explosive limit, we're already too late. And as Chris said, the, the robot would have to shut down. So there would be like a pre-alarm where it gets time to retrace its steps. And then the actual alarm where it hits the lower explosive limit and it would have to shut down at that point. Thanks, Ross. Great. Uh, I'm conscious of time. It's 10 o'clock and the time's up. That's been a fantastic discussion. Thank you, everybody. I've, I've certainly learned things in that. We've, we, you know, Simon kicked us off saying we can do it, but we've got a long way to go. That's true. We've covered things about open source and open interfaces. We've talked about standards um, uh, and how we deal with regulations and ATEX and how we make that more, more flexible. Um, we've looked at the marketplace for modules I've written here, and how we create some mess in a way that we let these architectures evolve and that they need to be dynamic over time because hardware changes. Um, uh, we've, we've recognized that one size won't fit all because all our customers or our applications are different, uh, but we want to be able to at least see if we can see, do some clustering around that, as Barry was saying, so that you can figure out what are the, 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 the architectures that are going to allow us to uh, address a number of problems from different sectors that were actually the same thing. Um, uh, and we've talked about challenges and using challenges in our cyber physical infrastructure is one of the ways that we're going to drive all this, this stuff forward. So listen, thank you very much. I've, I've found that I've really enjoyed that session. I've learned something, hurrah. It's joined the dots in my head. I hope it's done the same thing for you as well. Um, as Chris mentioned, we've recorded this. So if you want to go back and watch it again, um, it'll be available. Lindsay will circulate a link for it, I think. And the chat is also recorded. There's some great comments in the chat. Go back and read that again uh, at your own time later. And listen, thanks very much. That was a super session. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. And I look forward to seeing you the next time we're online together. Thanks a lot, everybody.